Then I became really obsessed with the question of the meaning of work and uh, does work have any kind of objective purpose or meaning and why should we work and why do other people find the work they do meaningful or if it's meaningless then why are they doing it? Welcome to Act in Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. In this episode, Dr. Brandon Vaidyanathan, associate professor and chair of the Department of Sociology at the Catholic University of America, shares his thoughts on organizational culture with Sarah Negri, research project coordinator at the Acton Institute at Acton University 2023. They discuss how culture affects us as humans without our being aware of it, and how we, in turn, can affect culture through our free choices and actions. Conversation topics include the competing values framework of evaluating a company's culture, culture drivers, including what Dr. Vaidyanathan calls scripts, models, and habits, the role of virtue in forming company culture, the principle of subsidiarity as a guidepost for good organizational culture, and the importance of integration in harmonizing the various social environments encountered by the individual. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Act in Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Welcome to Act in Line. I'm Sarah Negri, Research Project Coordinator at the Acton Institute, and I'm here today with Dr. Brandon Vaidyanathan, Associate Professor and Chair of the Department of Sociology at the Catholic University of America. He holds bachelor's and master's degrees in business administration from St. Francis Xavier University in Nova Scotia and HEC Montreal, respectively, and a PhD in sociology from the University of Notre Dame. Dr. Vaidyanathan's research examines the cultural dimensions of religious, commercial, medical, and scientific institutions and has been widely published in scientific journals. He is the author of Mercenaries and Missionaries, Capitalism and Catholicism in the Global South, published by Cornell University Press in 2019, and co-author of Secularity and Science, What Scientists Around the World Really Think About Religion, by Oxford University Press in 2019. His research has been funded by grants from the John Templeton Foundation, Templeton Religion Trust, and the Lilly Endowment. He is also the founder of Beauty at Work, a platform which includes a podcast and a YouTube channel exploring the role of beauty in our lives and in our work. Brandon, thanks for being with us today on Act in Life. Hey, it's an honor. Thank you. So I'd like to dive in today to the lecture that you gave for us at Acton University just recently entitled Organizational Culture. Um, speaking about the different cultures that we have in our organizations and why culture matters. Um, and you began by not defining what culture is. You said it was difficult to define what culture is, but could you explain your sense of what culture is, the things that contribute to it, especially in the organizational format? Yeah, it's a, it's a tricky concept, but I think, you know, typically when you ask people to think about the culture of their organization or any organization they've been in, they can quickly pinpoint a few words or phrases, right? So I think we have an intuitive sense of what, what we mean by culture, and um, usually it has something to do with norms, values, attitudes, and so forth, and, and I and I try to provide some of the frameworks around definitions of, of, of culture that have to do with either distinction between public and private culture, so that's the kind of, you know, the external like artifacts, material uh, objects and, and, and norms and discourses that are out there, and then the kind of uh, personal culture that is the stuff that's in our, in our heads, but also in our bodies, so our, 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 our skills, our habits, our dispositions, that's also part of culture, and then, and then the things we believe, the narratives we have, the stories we tell. Um, the values we adhere to, all of those are also part of culture. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, social scientists and management scholars try to make a distinction between the kind of 
deep-seated, deep-rooted, kind of hard-to-change, hard-to-see assumptions and, and the, the bedrock foundations of culture, uh, which which are which are the base, and then and then the higher levels having to do with the stuff that you can you can see that is the kinds of behaviors you have or the the sorts of um, uh, you know stories you tell or the rationales you might give, and then and then the sort of symbols and objects and so on at the very top that are they're very easy to see. So. Uh, so culture operates at various levels, and, and I've tried to provide some frameworks to help people sort through some of that. Can you talk a little bit about how culture impacts us, even if we're not aware of it? That was something I found very interesting in what you were saying, um, particularly our social environments and how they can form us at an unconscious level. Yeah, that's really a big thing. And you know, I'd done some research uh, about 10 years ago with uh, corporate professionals in India and the Middle East, and, and, and a lot of our conversations were around the ways in which they were shaped by the cultures they were in, and so they talked about how they had essentially been deformed by the the, the companies they were working with. And they're working with some of the top global companies, you know, IBM, Dell, HP, and so on. And they found themselves uh, becoming mercenaries. They 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 became essentially um, people who you know found it very hard to trust others in their environment. They were playing their cards close to their chest. They were afraid that someone would stab them in the back. They were they were making certain decisions to, to, to live their lives in a way that um, when they started working, they would have looked upon those behaviors and, and approaches as a somewhat abhorrent, and then they became those sorts of people over time and said, you know what, that's just the nature of the game. And so a lot of us, I think we are overconfident in our ability to navigate the world. We think that we are somehow impermeable, like we think that the, the environments we spend time in aren't really going to affect us and we are who we are, but that's not entirely true. We, we are shaped by the norms around us, by, by pressures to conform to behaving in certain ways, and, and, and often by desires of, of other people around us. And so we find desirable the things that others around us find desirable. And, and the more you spend time in a particular environment, the more you start imitating people unconsciously and the more you become... Um, like the, the the people in that environment, and and it's not impossible to to, uh, to to sort of thwart these these mechanisms, but it's very difficult. It takes a lot of work. How did you first get interested in this whole idea of culture? If you started in business, were you planning originally to go into business, and then you just started being interested in the workings of business and the more sociological perspective? Yeah, I started out in computer science actually I, oh, okay. when I when I started college. Like like most Indians who come to North America, I was going to be a computer programmer and work for like you know some IBM or something like that. Um, th- that was also around the time I. Uh, I had a religious conversion, so so my first year of college, I had uh, you know, grew, I grew, grew up Hindu and then became an atheist and then became a Roman Catholic, uh, all in Dubai, and uh, and then I moved to Canada for for my for, for 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 university, and I found myself asking questions about why should I do what I'm doing, why should I pursue a particular line of work, and and it wasn't convincing me to, to go into programming just because that's what people like me did. And I was at a liberal arts college in Nova Scotia and was forced to take courses in philosophy and sociology and psychology, thank God, um, because it really opened my eyes to the fact that we can actually reflect on our lives and ask ourselves questions. And I became really obsessed with the question of the meaning of work and uh, does work have any kind of objective purpose or meaning, and why should we work, and why do other people find the work they do meaningful, or if it's meaningless, then why are they doing it? And so I started moving into trying to understand um, why people behaved the way they did and 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 why they pursued certain lines of work and where they found meaning. And uh, increasingly that became clear that, that that was a kind of empirical question, and I had to sort of study it with the appropriate tools, and that's eventually what led me to sociology. Um, but I, you know, I'd grown up in different cultures, and I was always intrigued by just why people have different norms and attitudes and values and dispositions, and and um, you know, people from one particular part of India or from some particular part of the Middle East had very different expectations as to how you ought to behave and carry yourself, and what was appropriate or inappropriate, and. And in the context of an organization, when you have people from different cultures together, it becomes very interesting and challenging to see how those things work. Then also as companies, you know, say companies from North America go and, um, you know, have subsidiaries in different parts of the world, that also creates those kinds of problems. And so when I studied that in, in, in business school, those kinds of courses really spoke to me because I was I was familiar with some of those tensions. Um, and so I wanted to 
understand both people's pursuit of meaning, but then also what happens when people interact together. And, and essentially that's kind of what led me to, to do this sort of work. Yeah, that's fascinating. It seems like a really good example of exactly what you're describing, where the culture in the college you attended was really shaping you and starting to help you ask some of those questions. And then you took it a very intentional direction, um, very self-reflective direction. Um, yeah, the interplay Really interesting. Uh, we talk a lot about, at Acton about the social nature of the person. Um, it's one of our core principles. We're influenced by other people. We influence other people. We're made to be in community. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're embedded in in the world that we live in, um, but also have that the freedom, you know, the free will and um, individual liberty to be able to make our own decisions and choose kind of what we do with that self reflective character. So yeah. thanks for sharing that. Sure. What I'd like to do is sort of talk about organizational culture within the framework and the tools that you presented in your talk. If you could share a little bit of the overview of that, I'll ask you a few questions on that, and then maybe a little bit um, about um, some of the other projects that you've been working on in your research. Uh, But especially I'd like to hear some of... um, some of what you've explored with, I'm sure, the social teaching of the Catholic Church and how you apply that to organizational culture, any any ways you could see organizational culture being improved through some of those principles. Mm. Uh, so let's talk about the culture in general first. Uh, you mentioned the competing values framework in your talk, uh, where you divided companies into four general quadrants. Um, can you remind me of the scholar's name? You yeah, used? Cameron and yeah, Kim Cameron and and uh, and Quinn. I can't remember his first name now, but Cameron and Quinn are the are the ones who've been for you know thirty something years. They've been developing this this model and testing it in hundreds of companies. And and uh, it's a very sort of parsimonious framework to try to figure out like four types of cultures divided along two axes. And on one axis is whether the focus is more internal or external. That is either it's focused more on the employees versus focus more on the market and competition and so on. Uh, and then and then on the other axis, it's whether the uh, orientation is towards stability and control or towards flexibility and individuality. And so you have these four different types. One model is the more hierarchical model that's more kind of internal focused and much more control focused. And, and really the orientation there is about... Um, yeah, it's the classic sort of bureaucracy. You know, this is um, early 20th century Taylorism and an industrial production model where everything has to be standardized, controlled, etc. And uh, and and then and then that model has certain challenges where it's it's really not very flexible. It's it's uh, not open to innovation, and then it's hard to sort of adapt to market needs. And then the sort of market model, which which is the second one, would be uh, more external focused, but but really driven on on trying to sort of outperform the competition and and really try to again through rigid controls and cost cutting and so on uh, try to try to become competitive and and uh, and and do better than everybody else in the market and so GE was you know Jack Welch was kind of the 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 sort of paragon of this particular type of model and um, the focus is all on winning and uh, and that model has has a lot of challenges with morale and burnout and so on um, the other t- uh, you know uh, quadrant uh, which is more sort of uh, flexibility focused and 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 internal is the clan model which is much more about collaboration and family and teamwork and all of that you know we belong together we spend time together um, a lot of consensus decisions decision making um, but that too has its own its own challenges where it it may not have as much sort of attention to the market or to or to the sort of policies and processes that are needed um, and you know there was one of the sessions I was listening to uh, you know with Michael Miller was criticizing the sort of family model which is that you know, your business is not a family because we fire you and what kind of family you know do you want to be in that mm-hmm. fires you right so uh, so that's 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 the third one, and the fourth one is is the ad hocracy, which is much more innovation focused. And I like the name of that one. Yeah, yeah. So it's really kind of you know the anti process, and really you know much more flexibility to pivot and change plans and policies, and and and, and that you know is it feels a little flighty and a little chaotic uh, sometimes to people in that environment. And um, typically, you know, if you've got a startup, it may start out there, but it'll have to sort of then develop some policies and procedures and stability over time and it can't stay in that mode forever. Um, so, so people argue that you know that every organization needs some balance of these things. You don't want to be purely in one bucket. Every leader, like a good leader, needs to have some ability to, to, to do all those four types of, to lead in all those four types of environments. Uh, but that kind of framework, framework is really good to sort of quickly get a sense of, uh, given the 
say, the industry environment you're in, what are the kinds of challenges that an organization has to face? And is, is, is this a context in which organizations have to be really quickly adaptable? Or is it a context in which there really is very slow change? And so, you know, maybe a super innovative type organization may, may not do well over there. And if the policy uh, infrastructure there or the, the regulations there are really like um, very uh, onerous and, and hard to change, then then an organization that's trying to innovate might actually not take off. Whereas uh, in an environment that's that's very unstable, if you're trying to be a rigid hierarchy, um, you might struggle to survive. As as you know, some of the firms did. And I gave examples of General Motors and Toyota and the Numi uh, case study, which is a very prominent example of of culture change that helped um, GM move one of its worst performing factories to, to, to become one of its best um, because of, of the process of culture change that went in there. So this, this framework is very helpful in, in, in figuring out how to, how to uh, place your culture, how to situate, how to describe, situate your culture, and then also how to figure out where it needs to be and what leaders need to do in order to, to move in, in a better direction. Yeah, it seems very helpful. And I, I like that you said most companies probably want to have a mix of this, not just be purely one quadrant. Um, would you say that also is applicable to departments within a particular company? Some departments probably yeah. reflect more of the innovative capacity and some are more of the stable capacity. And I'm, cer- I'm sure that some employees would really gravitate towards one or the other, depending on temperament, personality, work yeah. style. Well, I mean, the, the classical tension is between engineering and marketing. And, you know, the, the, <laughs> the folks who want to do the kind of innovative sort of, you know, the, the people want to do like sales and so on that, you know, they're hindered by the, the folks that have, you know, the ability to design and, and, and to, to, you know, uh, you know, or even, yeah, between sort of, say, accounting and, you know, some of the more kind of innovative processes that, you know, people who want to develop some massive, you know, high budget operation and uh, you need realists to tell them, actually, we don't have the budget to it. So, uh, so they, yeah, those tensions are important and you do need, and, you know, there, there are tensions between, even individuals are drawn to different kinds of uh, environments. There's some people who uh, are very creative and, and will have a very hard time in a, in a more hierarchical structure environment. And families, too, I think, are like that. There are families that I think are much more, uh, you know, very rigid in terms of this is our culture and this is how we do things around here. And it's very hard to, you know, you know, kids need a lot of permissions versus others that are much more adhocracies. And, and they're certainly kind of more competitive families where... You know, you have to be the winner at every tournament or whatever, and you know. So, so I, so I think it's not just restricted to business, but it applies to all kinds of organizations. Sure, that makes sense. You also mentioned culture drivers, um, the kinds of things that um, create culture or move culture in particular directions, and you divided that into scripts, models, and habits. Can you talk a little bit more about each of those things? Yeah. So this is a you know, is my attempt at trying to get at like what actually. Um, leads cultures to sort of sediment and become, you know, sort of sort of emerge and 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 sort of become really these sort of hard to change things over time. But then also what what could operate as levers to help us to change culture. So it's one thing to identify what type of culture you are, but then how do you actually move, right? And so I I had a sense in doing this this research that I was doing with professionals in India and the Middle East that there were these three different kinds of of mechanisms. The first one I, I just call it scripts, which is it's all the sort of it's stuff that's kind of it's this declarative cultures, the things you can talk about and the things that that you hear around you. It's the stories that people tell, it's the narratives. It's also the sort of identities that people espouse. But there, there are things that you can consciously reflect on. Um, there are things you you say to one another. Uh, there are the the formal kinds of espoused values and 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 norms and and policies and so forth in an organization. But there are also uh, the the hidden curriculum or the kind of scripts that people say, well, you know, we may say that this organization is a family, but really to succeed in this environment, you've got to, you know, uh, talk to this person or suck up to this person or, or do this or that. And so that kind of disjuncture between what the organization formally espouses and then what people no is really the way to get things done. Uh, you know, the, the strategies they have to really adopt. All of that that fits into these scripts. And people, you know, you hear people say this to one another when they're mentoring one another, when they're when they're uh, giving advice to one another. That's the kind of place these scripts come out. And 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 when they're navigating their their life in the workplace, um, you know, in their complaints and and so forth. That's where you you see these scripts. Uh, the models are the are the people that we unconsciously imitate. And so this is. Um, 
it's a very common thing, especially when we're navigating a new environment, that we pay attention or, you know, we have this radar out for like, okay, who's succeeding here? Who's doing well here? What does it take to succeed and survive and thrive here? And we tend to latch on to the the, the habits and, and the desires and the, and the practices and even the... the uh, the gestures of of people who are successful, and I've seen this happen in organizations where people somehow inadvertently uh, imitate the hand gestures of the of their of their leader, or or even their the tonal inflections, and so you start to see that people are um, they're not doing this intentionally. This is this is something that as human beings we just know how to mirror each other, and and to succeed you have to be able to sort of fit in, and and we start doing this at a very young age. So. Uh, the, the the French uh, theorist René Girard talks a lot about mimesis and unconscious imitation, and and that sort of drives a lot of uh, our our ability to navigate our our way in the world, and and it also creates rivalry and and hostility and um, scapegoating and other kinds of of dysfunctional behaviors. Um, so so models are, are you know that those we imitate, and I think we can consciously start to recognize, okay, why am I doing this? Why do I desire this promotion? Or why do I, why am I wearing this particular, you know, suit or whatever, or like eating at this particular restaurant? Well, it's because these people were talking about it. And then you can, once you're aware that you're being driven by something else, you can start to say, well, what should I do? Who should be my model? Right? So, so you can't be without models. You can't live without imitating somebody, but you can choose to some degree who you, who you imitate. Um, and then habits are the, are the other kind of under the radar kind of, non-declarative sort of mechanism that, um, you know, the, the, the dispositions we develop, the tastes we develop, um, the organizations we're in, the environments we're in, the cultures we're in shape our tastes. And, and you can start working for a company for, you know, a few months and you'll, you'll find that there are things that you didn't like uh, at the beginning that you now like. And there are things that, you know, the other way around, uh, just by being in that environment. And that, that's, that's impossible to escape, but it's also something you can pay attention to and and their their habits that are individual habits, like how you work and how often you're going to the cafeteria to get that cookie. And, you know, like when you're stressed out, what are you doing? And you can change those kinds of habits. But then there are also organizational habits like, you know, uh, the Monday morning team meeting or, you know, like, is that is that something that's generative for the organization or is it draining? And you can start to change those kinds of rituals and routines as well. So so those were the three kinds of of. of culture drivers, as I call it. I don't know. I need a word for that. I, I, you know, I, just, I just came up with something. But uh, if people have suggestions, I'm, I'm, I'm all yours. But what, what do you call these things? You know, you know, cultural pillars or levers or something. But um, yeah, the, those are these, these three mechanisms. And have you found those to be pretty universal across the different cultures and countries that you studied? Yeah, those three things are. I mean, they are they are essential to every culture, right? And they're. Uh, I mean, you can't do without some kind of. Sto- we're storytelling creatures, so we have to inhabit some kind of story. And even they're micro stories. They're like like little stories about you know, I'm in this job because whatever you know, like I I um, I need I need the money for X, or you know, it could be something as banal as that to sort of some grand sense of purpose as to this helps me solve some problem in the world. And and we can't do without imitating other people and and we are creatures of habit and and you know um but uh, and then also i also think that that if you want to get at changing culture it, it's helpful to try to identify these three uh, domains and try to say okay well what stories are people telling each other what what shapes their imagination right what what is their the the, the narrative they are currently telling and 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 what would they like to be saying right you can you can try to think of like um one of the, some of the work I, I do uh, is on, on the concept of beauty, and 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 so I'm really interested in like what is, what is beautiful business or what is beautiful work, and it partly has to do with some kind of purpose that you find beautiful, right? That in in, in any kind of organization, uh, some vision of the world that you want to bring about, and and so uh, so you could do that through a nonprofit, uh, you could do that through a business, um, so 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 those narratives, I think. Uh, are imp- things that we can we can also uh, use to direct our actions, just as we can uh, in our habits and our and our and our choice of those we want to imitate. Sure, and I think yeah, that's a good pivot to what I'd like to ask you about next: about what virtues we need in organizational culture, uh, both as leaders. You've talked a lot about leaders and the way mm-hmm. they need to steer the culture of their companies, but also as employees of those companies. Um, there's ways that we can intentionally inform the culture around us. 
um, being aware that we're also being informed by it. Yeah. Um, and I'm curious where virtue fits into that, what you yeah. see the role of virtue to be, and maybe which virtues you s- see as the most important and most needed. Ooh, that's a tough one. Look, I think we're, I mean, so some of this is going to be really context dependent, country dependent, and industry dependent, right? So I think the kinds of virtues you would need on Wall Street are very different from the kinds of virtues you would need if you were in some manufacturing plant. And, and so they're very much... Um, and you know, also it would vary whether you you know are you working in New York City or are you working in like South Dakota and right. So I think the context really matters, and in some places, and also I think there are other factors like gender that that I think you know play a role. Like so, so women, there's a lot of research showing that women just tend to you know not speak up for themselves, and when they do speak up for themselves, they're penalized. They're sort of seen as being arrogant and so on. So, uh, and men need more humility, and you know need to learn how to how to be more. Uh, more humble and also to do more service. And so, so there's a lot of research showing that women tend to take on a lot of the community building or the sort of the organizational citizenship, like who's going to actually pick up the, you know, you've got an event and you'll you'll see typically it's the women who are like cleaning up after. And, and this that, you know, those sorts of things start to lead to things like pay differentials. They start to lead to, uh, oh, this person's not very competent because they're not yeah, they don't know how to speak up or assert themselves, or or, or you know prejudices or judgments that people make about uh, different groups. So, so I think th- those are you know. So, where does somebody need more courage? Where does somebody need more humility? Like those things, I think, are very much dependent on context and social location and 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 environment. So, it's very hard to say which one's the most important. Um, there's the other challenge I think we're facing now is is we are. Particularly in North America, we're in a world in which a lot of our institutions have failed. So families are failing, our, our associations, you know, like um, the, the, the churches and other kinds of civic groups that we're part of are no longer shaping us and forming us. And so where do people cultivate virtue, right? And is it the job of the workplace to form people in the values and, and in, the, in the virtues they should have been picking up in their families or in their schools or in their churches? Um, I want to say no, but 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 if not, then then what do we do, right? Um, and it's even a challenge for the university. I mean, I'm you know I'm primarily uh, an academic, and and we have debates around like what is the purpose of the university? Is it to educate the mind, or is it to to sort of be a mental health sort of center where we're you know figuring out how to deal with emotions? And one might say that the latter is not the function of the university, but there's no other place. Uh, people are so broken, and they're coming to us, and. If they're not capable of emotionally, like they don't meet the emotional prerequisites for learning, then how are you going to teach them? So, so that's I think a situation a lot of companies are in, where, where I think they're dealing with people who want meaning and purpose, and maybe they should be finding that meaning and purpose somewhere else and not in their work, but there is nowhere else for for these people. They've not been given those opportunities or whatever opportunities they find are not appealing to them. And and something goes wrong if you try to make work the be all and end all of life, um, and so so anyway, it's, it's a long winded answer, but but just trying to get it, it's very hard to sort of figure out what virtues are needed just because our our environment has changed and the meaning of of what it means to be a university or what it means to be a business is so dependent on that on that you were talking about embeddedness. Um, that environment in which we're embedded has changed so much that it, that you know we have to. Uh, figure things out in, in in that relationship. So that's tough. Yeah, I think it kind of comes back to the context of integration. What does integration mean? Um, and in your research for your book, you sort of propose these two ideas, these two conflicting um, narratives that people have, or two different parts of their lives, really, that I think you said something about they're symbiotic in a way, but they also conflict in lots of ways. Um, and this mentality of like, climbing the corporate ladder, trying to make money in the workplace, do anything you can to get ahead. You don't trust anybody. You're not loyal to the company. Like These virtues of trust and loyalty that you value in other spheres of your life just don't even cross your radar in the business world. And yet a lot of these people you say are also very faithful in their church communities, very religious. And so there's a segmentation and fracturing Mm -hmm. um, that occurs that is somewhat unique to the modern world, would you say? I think it's a hallmark of modernity. I mean, that's. I think that's what's make what makes us modern is our fragmentation. I think you know sure. we we just that's how we can navigate modernity. Is we split ourselves up into these different spheres and. and Do you think that's it, healthy? Is that my question is more yeah. is, is integration possible and yeah. then is it achievable? Is it something that we should be striving after? Yeah, it's a. T- it's you know I'm I'm kind of torn a little bit because I I I don't think the kind of integration where you're like. Um, 
completely absorbed into your work. Um, and this is sort of what I think a lot of people have been seeking since like the late 90s. So I've been studying this sort of meaningful and work stuff since the late 90s. And I found that just there was a lot of hunger for wanting to bring the whole person into work. And then you start to see this movement in, in companies where they want to uh, create workplaces where you can be a whole person so that uh, you don't really have to go anywhere else. And this is a one-stop shop for your spirituality. You can have your meditation center here and you can have your gym here in the company and you don't even have to leave the premises for daycare and we'll have, you know, everything's out there and then and, and the company. And then um, it seems very easy to manipulate people that way uh, when, when you have, you know, taken over their lives totally. Uh, so I don't know if that's necessarily healthy. I also don't see it as, as healthy to sort of, uh, the 1980s model of, you know, my my values, the things that I believe, my morality, something I check at the door. Um, and that was that was a sort of common assumption. That's not good either. Uh, people now are talking about, Simone Stolsov is talking about the good enough job. That's this, this sort of new, some sort of best-selling book right now on, on work. And it seems to be, be, be tapping into this hunger that people have to reclaim their lives back from work, uh, that work has taken over everything. And, and who am I outside of work? That has that lost uh, its sense of, of um, people have lost their sense of, uh, of their identities. So, uh, so, so is that a lack of integration if people say, you know what, I don't want my work to be everything? Uh, or is it healthy boundary work, right, to say that, uh, there's certain things that are appropriate for work and certain things that are not. There's there's so much of my time and energy I'm going to give to my work. And then, you know, part of it, I have to sort of preserve something for myself outside. Um, so I think that's the challenge that we're trying to figure out. I don't think we've got a really, really good sense of it. But I, I think I think what should matter is you don't like like you can you can compartmentalize your energy. You can compartmentalize your your time. I don't think you should compartmentalize your morality, right? So, so I think you have to still be the same fundamental self, mm -hmm. and and you have to be who you are and value the things that really matter to you, and that is the that like who I am has to be the same, you know, or ought to be the same rather, whether I'm in the workplace or in the gym or you know, um, with my family, uh, but you know, the my use of time and my my ability to to sort of shut off, uh, you know, that kind of thing. I think we need to learn how to do better. Um, and it's it's hard to do that without without making the mistake of the former, like without leaving your you know morality at the door. so so that's the the challenge where how do you uh, given again, we're in this in this context where we've lost those formative institutions, uh, how how can we learn to be whole selves? while also maintaining healthy boundaries. I think that's the really critical question of, of like whatever late, late, late modernity or whatever you want to call it that we're in right now. Do you see the principles of solidarity and subsidiarity coming into play here? Because part of the problem with integration, it seems to me, is there's all these unique individuals and they want to be seen as individuals. They want to be in touch with their own identity. And that's something I think there's a crisis of knowing yeah. who we are. Um, as you say, these smaller institutions that used to ground us are failing in a lot of ways. So people are finding their identity in things that um, are p fleeting or passing, um, not really able to ground them. Um, so you have the identity problems of being fractured in that. But, but I'd say even if you are rooted in that and you have a comprehensive value system, it's challenging when that comes into conflict with someone else's value system hmm. um, in a very diverse world. And so in the workplace, that seems to be happening a lot, um, especially on a large scale, you would just run into more conflicts. So sort of during your lecture, I was thinking about this principle of subsidiarity, handling things on the smallest level possible. It seems there's less conflict when there's more unity. So if you have smaller teams and smaller groups who share more values um, in certain areas of life, and like you said, you can divide your time into these different segments or different smaller institutions of of shared value. Yeah, um, you can get a lot more done with with a healthier culture and maybe less conflict um, than sort of having top down approach of establishing this organizational culture for everybody that maybe conflicts with some people. Could you comment on that? Yeah, so I was talking to Tony Bond uh, recently. He's the, the the head of this uh, best places to work. You know, you've seen all these sort of mm -hmm. you know. Um, rankings and so on that they do. And, and he was saying one of the things is they find among the sort of, you know, the best companies now is that people uh, find these microcultures that they gravitate to. So so for me to belong to, you know, some like, like HP or whatever, I, it's not that I, 
uh, that I'm part of some macro culture, but rather it's this particular group. It's a little bit like the megachurch culture in in the states, where you've got um, you know a very tight sense of belonging to some small group of people, and that's that's how I'm I'm a member of Willow Creek by virtue of my belonging to that particular group, and not to some sort of nebulous entity that you know has has uh, tens of thousands of people. Um, so so I think I think there's something to that. Those smaller communities are are you know. They're not quite the same as um, civic associations or, or you know, uh, in the workplace, but but they are they are your sort of locus of of, of your identity, and and I think that um, yeah, there 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 are challenges there too as people navigate. Like you know, how, how can I? To what extent am I friends with these people? To what extent is this a professional relationship? And so that's that's a challenging thing. Um, I, I don't. I don't think we know how to do that anymore, and I. And I, I'm not sure again that we we were doing it very well in the past either. Uh, but friendship is another thing we don't know how to do anymore. Uh, we don't know how to maintain friendships as adults. At least men don't. Um, we. Yeah, I, th- I think this is the thing. Like if you have a very rich, uh, and this, this I'm thinking of sort of subsidiarity more broadly. Like if you are you know, in a neighborhood and invested in the activities of your neighborhood, if you are invested in, in your town, if you're invested in your in your kid's school, if you're invested in your kid's soccer team, um, like those are all of these little circles that that provide, you know, us with, with ways to fulfill our, our human needs. Um, if you're doing all of that, you can't be, you know, completely invested in your work. And, and I think that's the way it ought to be. And companies ought to figure out how to incentivize more of that to happen. Uh, rather than less of it. So, so, it's a, so for companies to sort of nurture subsidiarity, I think they have to sort of not only do it internally by allowing these small groups to exist. And the challenge with small groups is they can be silos. So so that's the other thing where those teams, you know, don't, those groups don't talk to each other and they don't actually help the common good of the company. So that is a danger that that, that even, even Tony was talking about. Um, but then also the company has to recognize it's not, it can't be and shouldn't pretend to be the whole of that employee's life and it shouldn't try to colonize it, right? So to sort of to have a, a concerted uh, effort, and I, you know, I'd mentioned Brunello Cuccinelli, like one of the, you know, their principles uh, in, in, that, in that organization are, you know, they're, they're very strict about your time use, that you shouldn't be checking email on evenings and weekends, you, you should be going home for lunch. And uh, so those kinds of practices, I think, are very helpful in order to, to like, help people to find a, a, a way to um, to figure out what is yeah what are the appropriate spheres of of life that they should be uh, embedded in? Yeah, I think that's right. And conversely, you want to be careful that work doesn't become um, endless toil, just completely draining. Uh, right. That's segmented right. off from your life. Right. Right. Um, that seems to be what you're focusing on with your beauty at work project. I'd love to hear more about that, kind of how it got started. Yeah. Um, and then what you see as the best way to bring beauty to work. Yeah. Wow. So, I mean, the project started in a very strange way. I was talking to scientists. I was doing a big study of scientists um, a number of years ago, uh, and, and we were talking to them about uh, their their work lives, and, and many of them talked about the sacrifices they'd made for the sake of their their profession, including sacrificing lucrative jobs in industry. So these were academic scientists who were working, like doing what's called bench science or fundamental science, so, so not curing cancer or not, you know, working on defense, you know, or developing some some fancy gadgets that would make a lot of money but but rather just like pursuing fundamental questions uh, and and they'd sacrifice their health you know with long hours in the lab sometimes even sacrifice their families just uh, you know not being present to them and and so we'd ask them well, why do you do it and I was rather shocked to hear many of them say because it's beautiful it was not a word I, I personally associated with science and uh, it was not something I, I would expect to hear from scientists but they talked about it so much. In these conversations on on what what was meaningful to them about their work, that I started to do a, a concerted uh, research study just on what do they mean by beauty? Why does it matter so much to them? And what you know, what is it? What does it look like? How does it operate? And and so we studied physicists and biologists in four countries: uh, the U.S., U.K., Italy, and India for the last three years, and um, and we learned a lot. And I learned that that beauty is. You know, it means a little bit. Uh, it's not exactly the same thing in physics and biology. You know, physicists are drawn to things like symmetry and simplicity. Biologists are drawn more to to visual beauty and to and to to complexity. But the heart of what what unites those disciplines is the beauty of understanding. So, gaining an insight into how reality works, peeking behind 
the appearances into the mechanisms that that drive uh, the, the way that the natural world works and, and go, ah, that's how things are. That is beauty. And, and that is the kind of beauty that is worth making sacrifices for. And, and so I was, I was deeply moved by a lot of these conversations I had. We interviewed some 200 scientists, surveyed some 3,500. And, um, and I started to wonder whether other professions that we don't associate with beauty might have similar kinds of judgments about, about what's beautiful. And so I started talking to lawyers. I started talking to restaurateurs um, and, uh, uh, you know, generally folks in, in, in other domains of, of business, but also poets and, you know, other fields, just trying to understand, like, what, what does this word mean in, in, in the kind of work you do? And I found uh, a, lot of, a lot of similar uh, threads and, and, and also a lot of unique contextual differences. So that's the project. I'm trying to understand what beauty means and what is beautiful work, what is beautiful business, what it, what it means in, in one's particular domain, whether you're a cocktail bar owner or whether you're um, working in, in fashion or um, archi- you know, if you're a designer. And, and, uh, and, 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 I, and I'm interested in, um, yeah, not, not just sort of beauty in the products that you're developing or whatever, but also what is, what is beauty in terms of the, the meaning of what is there, is there a beautiful purpose and what would that look like? Is there beauty in, in the process, you know, or, or, uh, or you know, to what extent uh, does even the production of beautiful things require a messy and ugly process? Um, and, uh, and, and then all the role of people in, 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 in what we find beautiful. So, so those are some of the things I'm exploring. Yeah, that's super cool. Um, I tend to approach this from a philosophical perspective. That's the lens through which I see the world. But sure. um, yeah. I, I think beauty to me seems to indicate there's a value in itself mm-hmm. of whatever the yeah. thing is. So these scientists seem like they're seeing something valuable yeah. in understanding the process itself, regardless of what it's going to be used for. Right. If it's not even going to cure cancer or anything, but Correct. they're just interested in the process because it's beautiful. They're marveling at something that exists yeah. purely for its own sake. Yeah. And there's a, there's a an immunologist that I interviewed. So I have a podcast on this and I, you know, I have uh, been interviewing uh, for the first season, a lot of scientists and, and, and philosophers of science. Um, but one immunologist told me, you know, I was feeling kind of bad because um, I had this advisor once, once asked me, you know, like you're looking at these cancer cells and, and do, do you, do you, do you find this interesting because it would allow you to cure cancer or just because you find the structure of the virus or, or the cancer cell fascinating. And he says, it's the latter. I, I don't really care about curing cancer as much as I care about the structure wow. of, of these cells. So, <laughs> so he's a, now he's an immunologist and he loves the, the COVID virus. Like wow. he finds it immensely beautiful in spite of how, you know, whatever evil it is, if you want to call it, but I mean, it's, it's non-living thing, but, but, uh, in spite of the harm it's, it's doing in the world or whatever, but it's, it's that the, the structure of this thing that exists is beautiful. It's, it's function as, as, as a mechanism, as a, as a marvel of engineering is, is something that arrests your, your, your attention and, and pulls you out of yourself and, and has the same qualities as a, you know, as a Mozart symphony, you know? Yeah, that seems to be something very valuable we could bring to the workplace as well. And you talked about that GM Toyota example where as soon as employees started taking ownership, yeah. the culture was changed and they were able to um, really see value in the work they're doing for its mm. own sake. Yeah. So if that came more more and more to the workplace in those areas where it was needed, it seems like it could be a similar situation. Yeah, and it's yeah, so it's that intrinsic aspect mm-hmm. of, of of the intrinsic, intrinsic motivation, but also that there's a kind of aspect of uselessness that it, this is not... It's not simply a means to something else, right? And mm-hmm. and it is I mean, that word is almost offensive to so many of us. Useless, but but beauty is useless. I mean, that yeah. that is precisely <laughs> one of its qualities. Yeah, I wonder if that could contribute to not solving the problem of higher education, but stop thinking about it completely as instrumental. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to do it. I mean, <laughs> I I, that's, that's why I study it. Like I, you know, I'm 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 as you know. Uh, vulnerable to any of these critiques uh, as anybody else, and I and I just you know I'm, I'm yeah I, maybe this is, is I, I desire to know how to how to live a beautiful life or to work in a way that's beautiful, and so I'm getting advice from all the people that I'm interviewing, uh, and I hope someday to implement it. So. Yeah, it sounds like a really interesting project. Yeah, thank you. Um, last question: I'd like to hear a little bit more about another project that you've worked on. Um, 
a research project of American priests mm. and the challenges that they face in their parishes, interactions with their bishops as well. It's a pretty large-scale project, right? You said, I think, 300 priests you had interviews with? We, well, in-depth interviews with 100 and something, but we surveyed 10,000 of them and, you know, 36 of 3,600 uh, took the survey or completed it. Um, so it's a nationally representative survey that we can say with confidence that, you know, 82% of priests live in constant fear of a false accusation of sexual abuse. So it's a hard number yeah. and, and, a, and, a, and a sad reality. Yeah. Um, what have you found to be some common responses um, in terms of the culture of parish life. I think that's something a lot of Christians in America are concerned about um, their churches. What's the culture of the church? Because it's not a business. It's not yeah, an organization in yeah. that sense. It's more one of those smaller institutions that's meant to form us um, in character and virtue. Yeah. Um, but it's it's very important that that culture run effectively as well. And too many, in too many cases, I think it can be very toxic. Mm. Um, what what responses have you seen from that survey of priests, um, and are there any solutions that you could propose to some of their concerns? Well, we didn't ask very much about the culture of their parishes, um, okay. I, and I, I don't know if priests would be the right people to ask about the culture of the parish. You'd have to ask the parish about the culture of the parish, and so priests may not have the best perspective. Um, but we did ask them about the culture of their dioceses, and 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 by that they usually meant of, of fellow priests in relation to the bishop. And, and by and large, those didn't look very good. And we find that most priests don't have a lot of trust in, in their bishop. They don't think their bishop would have their back if somebody came to them with a false accusation or like if they were you know, uh, accused. Uh, they, they don't feel very supported by their bishops. They, they feel like... Um, and then there's some history to it. There were some policies that were put into place after the clergy sexual abuse uh, uh, crisis that... Um, were put into place in such a way that that priests were bearing the the, the brunt of, of of a lot of these policies, and and bishops were somehow immune to it, and you know that led to a lot of issues. And so, without going into too much detail, but but there was some betrayal there that they that they feel, and there's there's some moral injury that still needs to be repaired. But uh, but there are that being said, there are uh, there are dioceses where priests do trust their bishop and do find the bishops to you know to be effective and their leadership to be effective, and so. Uh, so we're trying to get at well, what you know what accounts for some of these differences, and um, and so certainly one of the the, the, the things that really seems to matter uh, in in the cases where priests do find their bishops to be effective, or at least when you ask them what is it they want from good leaders, uh, they want vulnerability. They want their bishops to say, "I screwed up. I messed up. I'm sorry," or "We screwed up." Um, they want uh, a, 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 a culture where, where where bishops treat them. Uh, where bishops are, are fathers to them rather than CEOs, right? So the CEO model works very well in the corporate world. It's probably inappropriate for, for the church. And yet in very large dioceses, if you're an archdiocese with more than 500 priests, how do you not be a CEO, right? How do you, how do you be a father to 500 people? So, so I understand it's a bit challenging. So maybe what, what priests want may not be realistic. Maybe, maybe there needs to be some, some other kind of, uh, you know, resetting of expectations or change in structure or other ways in which they can they can rebuild that relationship. Um, one of the challenging findings is that what really seems to predict whether a priest trusts his bishop or not is the alignment uh, of, of, of theology and politics. So, so the, the, the priest who sees his bishop as having the same theology and same politics is more likely to trust him than, than a priest who sees his bishop as having you know, so so a priest is very conservative politically and theologically. If his bishop is very progressive, he doesn't trust him, and vice versa. Um, that's not a very good thing to have in a faith community. Where I think we need to, you know, particularly in, at least in, in, the, in the church and in Christianity, we, we need to have some sort of uh, criterion that is that is pre-political or, or you know, that transcends politics. And and it's unfortunate that that our polarized society, I think, is affected. Uh, the church as well, and then it affects trust. So, so figuring out how to get beyond that is, I think, really important as well. Mm-hmm. Brandon, thanks for a great conversation. Thanks sure. so much for joining us on Act in Line. Yeah, thank you. Honored to be here. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. 
Until next week, for Acton Line, I'm Eric Cohn.